slept in the bivouac amidst his troops, having first made all the generals who were there sup with him. Before he laid down, he descended the hill of Yenna on foot to be certain that no ammunition wagon had been left at the bottom. He there found the whole of Marshal Land's artillery sticking in a ravine, which in the obscurity of the night had been mistaken for a road, and which was so narrow that the linchpins of the wheels rubbed against the rocks on both sides. There was thus no getting forward or backward, and there were a hundred wagons, one behind the other in the defile. This artillery was intended to be the first in service, the artillery the other corps were being behind it. The emperor was excessively angry, but showed his displeasure only by cold silence. He inquired frequently for the general who had the command of the artillery and appeared greatly astonished at his absence, but without wasting time in reproaches, he set to work himself to do the duty of an artillery officer. He collected the men, made them get their park tools, and light the lanterns, one of which he held for the convenience of those whose labors he directed. In this way, the ravine was sufficiently widened, and the extremities of the axle trees cleared of the rocks. I shall never forget the expression in the countenance of the men on seeing the emperor lighting them with a lantern, nor the heavy blows with which they struck the rocks. They were exhausted with fatigue, but no one uttered a complaint. All felt the importance of the service in which they were engaged, and they did not refrain from expressing surprise at finding that it should be necessary for the emperor himself to set this example to his officers. The emperor did not leave the spot until the first wagon had passed through which was not until late in the night. He afterwards returned to his bivouac and issued some orders before he reposed himself. This happened on the night between the 13th and 14th of October. On that night, there was a horror frost, accompanied by a thick fog similar to that which we experienced at Austerlitz, but it was favorable to us, for we were upon a level height of a limited extent, which obliged us to form the troops in large masses, almost touching each other in order to facilitate their deploying in the morning. This level was now more than 200 toises from the position occupied by the left of the Prussians. Had it not been for this fog, our fires would have served as a direction for the enemy and their artillery would have done us considerable mischief, for every shot would have told. However, fortune favored us wonderfully, for the fog lasted until 8 o'clock the next morning. We were under arms at daybreak, but the fog was still thick, and we could not see our way in advancing on the enemy's line. Besides the wood on which his left rested, there was a tract of ground by which we could pass, as had been ascertained on the day before, but in seeking it during the fog, we came upon the wood, which the enemy occupied. A skirmish then began, which afforded the Prussians a point of direction. We now got into the right road by turning a little to the left, and the artillery was conducted in that direction in close columns. The Prussian line, finding itself attacked and fearing a grand movement in front, proceeded to maneuver to gain a position near its main body. It was now nine in the morning. We had fired only a few guns, and with the exception of the 17th Light Infantry, which attacked the wood, none of our troops had been engaged. The atmosphere cleared up, the sun shone bright, and we were in the presence of the Prussians. The cannonade commenced in the center and was more brisk on the side of the enemy than on ours. Marshal Ney, who was on the right of Marshal Land, attacked the extreme left of the Prussians. He carried a village which formed it. Uh, Puy was repulsed, retook the village, and was again driven from it. He would in all probability have lost a great many men, had not one of Marshal Sewell's divisions, which arrived in our extreme right, and which, notwithstanding its excessive fatigue, was marched forward, completely outflanked. The point which Marshal Ney was so obstinately set upon holding, though it was quite out of our natural position. The movement of Marshal Sewell's division caused the evacuation of the village and had only half an hour's patience been exercised before it was attacked. The lives of many brave men would have been spared. The emperor was very much displeased at Marshal Ney's obstinacy. He said a few words to him on the subject, but with delicacy, this movement for occupying the point on which the extreme left of the Russians rested was seconded by a vigorous attack operated on their center by Marshal Land. 
who wished to give them a close discharge of musketry. The boldness of his advance made the Prussian army change front on its right wing, the left wing in the rear. This obliged us to perform the opposite movement, namely, to change front on our left wing with our right wing in advance. The action recommenced along the whole front. And a fortunate incident gave us the victory. The emperor had left Marshal Ogaro at Mentz to form a corps with the regiments, which after the Peace of Austerlitz had been sent to France and which were ordered to repair to Mentz by forced marches. Ogaro made so rapid a march from Mentz that he arrived at Yenna while the action was going on. He did not pause a moment. And appeared in the field of battle at the moment when the Prussian line was attacked in the position I have described. Marshal Ogaro's column advanced through a fir wood in such a manner that it debouched in the rear of the Prussian right. The 14th Regiment of the line was at the head of the column. It commenced an attack of musketry before the Prussians had time to reconnoiter it. This attack, being vigorously maintained, caused a retrograde movement on the right of the Prussians, which made their whole line waver. The Emperor had but few cavalry with him. The parties, which were in the direction of Naumburg, had not yet arrived so that we had on the field of battle only one brigade of light cavalry commanded by General Durnell, another commanded by General Auguste de Colbert, and the 1st, 9th, and 11th regiments of Hussars. The above corps of cavalry were all assembled in our center, and the moment the oscillations in the Prussian line was observed, they were set forward and ordered to charge with desperation. The charge succeeded, and disorder and rout began to appear among the Russians. They tried the effect of bringing forward their own cavalry, which by ours being weak, weaker, were for an instant check, but this did not enable their army to rally, and it was completely broken. The head of the Grand Duke of Berg's cavalry arrived at this moment on the ground, and uniting with the rest, proceeded on the road to Weimar, along with the Prussians, who were flying. The emperor, at the moment where he stood, saw the flight of the Prussians and our cavalry taking them by thousands. Night was approaching, and here, as at Austerlitz, the emperor rode round the field of battle. He often alighted from his horse to give a little brandy to the wounded, and several times I observed him putting his hand into the breast of a soldier to ascertain whether his heart beat, because in consequence of having seen some slight appearance of color in his cheeks, he supposed he might not be dead. If he found a greater number of dead on one part of the field than another, he looked at the buttons to ascertain the number of the regiment, and it was his custom. At the first review in which he saw that regiment to ask questions as to the manner in which it attacked, or had been attacked, in order to discover the cause of the loss, he had observed. While thus making the tour of the field of battle, I saw... Him two or three times discover in the manner I have mentioned men who were still alive on these occasions. He gave way to a joy, which is impossible to describe, but which was quickly followed by a melancholy expression occasioned by the reflection that there were many others in the like situation whom he could not hope to find. This evening, he was upon the whole pretty satisfied with what he had done. The commissariat had performed its duty. The wounded were collected without delay and everywhere attended with the greatest care. He returned to pass the night at Yenna, where he received the professors of the university. He made a present to the vicar of that town, who had distinguished himself by his humane attention to the comfort of the wounded and the prisoners. He took some repose at Yenna and received during the night very satisfactory news from Davout's corps. Chapter 23. The Grand Prussian Army, under the immediate command of the king, which was marching on Naumburg, had halted and taken position at the village of Auerstadt in front of Sultz, which formed its headquarters. When information was received there of the arrival of Davu in Bernadotte with a numerous body of cavalry at Naumburg on the same day, the 14th of October, of which the emperor attacked the Prince of Hohenlohe in front of Yenna, Davu, and Bernadotte in pursuance to their instructions marched from Nauberg by the Weimar Road on which the Prussian army was advancing. Our cavalry, so spirited in the field of battle, was seldom directed with judgment when the object was to attain intelligence of the enemy. On this occasion, amongst others, Marshal Davu was unable to gain any information respecting the march of the Prussian army except what he learned in consequence of a bold reconnaissance made by one of his aides-de-camp, Colonel Burke, 
now a general and peer of France. He had, in fact, no fixed opinion as to the force coming against him, except that which he formed on the report of a deserter from the Prussian bodyguard who had formerly served in France in the King's Regiment, in which he was a sergeant. This very intelligent man communicated to Marshal Davou most minute details concerning the Prussian army. Davou's corps was at the head of the column. He communicated the information which he had received to Marshal Bernadotte, whose troops immediately followed his. Davou had no sooner reached the summit of the hill, which is necessary to ascend after passing the stone bridge on the Sala, about a league from Naumburg, than he discovered the Prussian army. He immediately dispatched a messenger to Bernadotte and requested that he would support him. Bernadotte insisted on passing to the front. Davou replied that chance having placed him at the head of the column, it was not just that he should retrograde. And besides, that this movement would expose them both to total destruction if they were attacked while executing it and remarked that there was not a moment to be lost. He further observed that he gave him this notice in the name of the emperor's service and that as to himself, he was going to debauch and would immediately attack the enemy. Bernadotte from motives which have never been well explained, replied that he was looking for a passage higher up the river and that Davu might attack with safety because he would second him. Much Davu attacked with an inferiority of one to four. Scarcely was his court formed when he was assailed by a cannonade and discharges of musketry which were vigorously maintained as the enemy thought they were sure of destroying him. And it is but justice to say that had it not been for his great courage and firmness under fire, his troops would have been completely disheartened. He had lost one third of his force by three o'clock in the afternoon. He could only retain his men in the field of battle by showing himself everywhere. His aides de camp hastened in every direction to Marshal Bernadotte to request him to debauch, but all in vain, for he spent the whole day in seeking a passage by roads where none was to be found and allowed Marshal Davout to be crushed. Marshal Davout also experienced the same obstacles. When he sent for cavalry, his aides de camp carried repeated orders to the division of cavalry to join him immediately as the danger was imminent. But Bernadotte detained them and prevented them from taking part in the action. It happened with this cavalry to which he had no right to give orders. As with the corps which he commanded, it was of no use either to Kozin or at Yana where it did not arrive in time. Davu was indebted to his great valor and the confidence placed in him by his troops for the glory he won on this day, which was to him one of the most honorable that a general officer could expect in his military career. Notwithstanding the loss which he sustained, he took from the enemy 70 pieces of cannon and forced him to retreat. Had he been supported by a corps of cavalry, he would have made a great number of prisoners. But he might consider himself extremely fortunate that he was able to keep the field. This state justly obtained for him the admiration of the whole army. The loss of the Prussian army, which he attacked, was great. The Duke of Brunswick, who was wounded, died at Altona. The king, on learning what had happened to the duke, made a movement by his left flank to regain the odor and rally the corps, which was retreating from Jena on Weimar and Erfurt. Marshal Davout could not follow the King of Prussia's army in consequence of the want of cavalry, so that the retreat of that monarch was not obstructed. Adjutant General Ramuf, who brought the report of this affair to the Emperor at Yenna, said nothing of the inaction of the cavalry, nor the refusal of Bernadette to take part in the battle. The Emperor allowed him to go on to the end of his narration and then asked him, what those corps had done during the conflict, Romuf was obliged to confess that none of them were present and appeared not to know anything of the motives which had withheld them. The emperor saw that something was concealed from him. He did not insist much upon explanations, but he bit his lips and became only the more impatient to ascertain the truth. Prisoners poured into Yenna the whole of the night, and among them was almost the whole of the Saxon infantry and several generals. The emperor assembled these generals together with all the Saxon officers in the hall of the university, and as none of them could speak French, Monsieur de Moustier, who belonged to our foreign office, acted as interpreter. The 
and thus address the officers. Saxons, I am not your enemy, nor the enemy of your elector. I know that he has been obliged to follow and to aid the designs of Prussia. You have fought, and ill fortune has made you forfeit your liberty. If you have sincerely entered into the interests of Prussia, you must follow her destiny. But if you can assure me that your sovereign has been constrained to take up arms against me, and that he will seize this opportunity of resuming his natural policy, I will overlook the past and will henceforth live on friendly terms with him. Mr. Fool, a Saxon general officer who was particularly attached to the elector Saxony, replied that he would undertake in two days to go to Dresden as the bearer of this generous proposition to his sovereign and to bring back his reply. He said he was convinced that the proposal would not only be conformable to the sentiments of the elector, but that the emperor's generosity would fill him with gratitude. May I rely on you, said the emperor. Yes, sire, replied Monsieur Fool. Well, resumed the emperor, depart until the elector that I send back his troops, and that I beg he will command those who are yet in the Prussian army to leave it. The Saxon prisoners set out immediately. They went by the way of Leipzig. The emperor departed instantly in an open carriage for Weimar. On reaching the top of the mountain, commonly called the Snail, we saw a Prussian officer coming up to us conducted by an officer of our advance guard. This was an aide-de-camp of the king of Prussia's. He was the bearer of a letter from the king to the emperor, in which an armistice was proposed. The emperor desired me to direct the officer to follow him to Weimar, where he would give him an answer. The emperor then continued his journey rather more speedily, and on arriving at Weimar before he received the officer, he made some arrangements, which led me to suppose that either from the date of the king of Prussia's letter or from some other circumstances, he had ascertained the situation of the principal Prussian army. He dispatched orders to Marshal Bernadotte to march immediately to Halle, by the way of Mersburg, and to force the two passages of the Elster, which were defended by the court of Prince Frederick of Wittenberg. The corps commanded by Marshal Lenn had marched upon Erfurt. The rest was directed upon the Elbe, part by Mersburg, and part by Leipzig. The emperor stopped two days at Weimar in order to ascertain what the enemy would determine upon. During this short interval, the town of Erfurt, where the Prince of Orange commanded, capitulated, and 18,000 prisoners were taken. This event afforded us the opportunity of carrying our line of operations through that place, which was a great advantage because it considerably shortened the march from Mentz to the army. After sending back the king of Prussia's aid to camp, the emperor received the Prussian general, Schmittau, who had formerly been aide to camp to Frederick the Great, and who was a man celebrated in various ways. He had been wounded in the late battle and remained at the castle of Weimar, where he died shortly after. The emperor did not grant the armistice supplied for by the king of Prussia because our army was advancing, and if it had halted, we should have oppressed our allies with the maintenance of our troops, and besides, it was necessary that we should take up a military position. In seeking an armistice, the king of Prussia had evidently no other object in view than to preserve his own states from the burden against which we wished to secure our allies. We therefore continued our march. The emperor left Weimar and slept at Nauberg, where Marshal Davout and his court were stationed. He expressed his entire satisfaction with the conduct of Davout, and he received a true account of the conduct of Marshal Bernadotte on and the cavalry on the 14th. He was silent for a moment, and he then burst into reproaches. This is so shameful, he added, that if I were to bring him to a court-martial, it would be equivalent to ordering him to be shot. The best way is to overlook it. I think he is not so devoid of honor as to not feel the full extent of his misconduct, respecting which I shall not fail to let him know my opinion. Next day, we left Naumburg to proceed to Mersburg and Halle. In this march, we passed over the field of Rosbach. The emperor was so perfectly well acquainted with the dispositions of Frederick's army and ours that on arriving at Rosbach, he said to me, gallop on in that direction, pointing the way he meant, and at a distance of half a league, you will see the column which the Prussians erected in commemoration of the Battle of Rosbach. 
If the harvest had not been over, I should not have discovered the object of my search. For the column which stood in the middle of a vast plain was not higher than one of those posts which are fixed up in harbors for the purpose of attaching vessels by ropes to the keys. When I found it, I waved my handkerchief as a signal to the emperor who had deviated a little from his road to inspect the field of battle. He came to see the column. The inscriptions were so much obliterated that they were almost illegible. The emperor observed General Suchet's division passing at some distance, and he sent to order it to come up and remove the column, which he wished to convey to Paris. General Suchet set his company of sappers to work, and the column was speedily placed on some carriages. The whole army was now approaching the Elba. The emperor received information that the bridge at Dessau had been burned by the prince of Württemberg, whom Marshal Bernadotte was pursuing. The bridge of Wittenberg had, however, been saved. We had commenced our movement on Dessau. Nothing would have been saved by countermanding it and directing it upon Wittenberg. Besides, we hoped that our sappers would be enabled to repair the bridge at Dessau so that we might continue our march in that direction. If the Prince of Wittenberg had not burnt the bridge, it is impossible to say what would have been the fate of the Prussian army, which, after fighting at Jena and Austerlitz, had no passage across the Elba, but at Magdeburg. We were a vast distance in advance, and another battle must have been fought before the Prussians could have debouched in that direction. The event must have been fatal to them, had not the king adopted other plans. On arriving at the Sau, the residence of the Prince of Anhalt, the emperor went himself to inspect the bridge, which was two-thirds burnt. The repairs were actively commenced, but finding that it would be a work of considerable time, the emperor preferred crossing at Wittenberg. Next day, all the troops marched in the direction of the latter place, which they reached the same evening. By this movement, nearly a day was lost. Chapter 24. On the road from Dessau to Wittenberg, we met Marshal de Rock, who was returning in an open carriage with intelligence of a mission with which he had been charged. The emperor made him mount a horse, and directing everyone to go forward, he rode by the side of the marshal at a sufficient distance behind us to prevent their conversation being overheard. It was not until long after that we understood De Rock had been sent from Weimar to the King of Prussia. He managed the affair with so much secrecy that we knew nothing of his departure until after he was gone. He never informed us where he had been. But as reports of peace were circulated as soon as we entered Berlin, we concluded that he had been charged with some pacific negotiations, as will subsequently be seen. As soon as the emperor arrived at Wittenberg, he inspected the fortress and ordered some new works to be added to those which were already executed. Here he remained two days to afford time for the whole of the army to cross the Elba. The French effected this operation before the Prussians, and thus we still had to start of them in the subsequent movements. The emperor entrusted Marshal Ney with the blockade of Magdeburg. The marshal surrounded the fortress in the best manner he could. That is to say, after the Prussians had recrossed the Elba. The emperor, with the rest of the army, advanced to Berlin by the Potsdam Road in order to dispute with the enemy the passage of the spree. The whole army was one or two marches in advance when he set out from Wittenberg. It was about one in the afternoon. The sky was overcast and a storm was gathering. As we passed through one of the suburbs of Wittenberg, the hail began to fall. The emperor lighted to get shelter, and he entered the house of the district inspector of forests to the elector. The emperor thought he was not known, and he regarded merely as an ordinary civility the respectful manner in which he was received by two young women who were in the apartment which he entered. They appeared much surprised and embarrassed, and having risen from their seats, they continued standing as well as some children who were with them. And the prettiest of the two slaved in an undertone, Heavens, it's the emperor! The emperor did not notice this, but I observed it, as I happened to understand a little German. He asked the lady whether she was married. Sire, I'm a widow, she replied. The emperor appeared surprised, and again addressing her, he said, Where did your husband die? The lady replied, In war, sire, in your majesty's service. You know me then? Yes, sire, you are not altered, and I recognized you immediately, as well as General Bertier and General Savary. 
Where have you seen me before? In Egypt, sire. The emperor was now more astonished than before. What? said he. Have you been in Egypt? How happened you to go thither? Sire, said the lady, I am a native of Switzerland, and I married a Monsieur de Blanc, a physician in the army. He died of the plague at Alexandria, and I married again. My second husband was colonel of the 2nd Regiment of Light Infantry, and he was killed at Abukir. He left me with a son, whom I have brought up. On my return to France with the army, I could not obtain my pension, and tired of the repulses I experienced, I returned to Switzerland, which I again left on being engaged by this lady to educate her children. But, said the emperor, were you really married to the colonel, or was it merely a connection with your circumstances induced you to form? Sire, my marriage contract is upstairs. She ran to fetch it. Here it is. You see that my son is born in lawful marriage. The emperor was much pleased, and he exclaimed, Part Dieu. This is a curious meeting. He then ordered Bertrand to take down the names of both the mother and the son. The storm is now over, and the emperor being about to depart, he said, Well, madame, as a memorial of this day, I grant you an annual pension of 1,200 francs with the reversion to your son. He then mounted his horse and set off. In the evening, before he retired to rest... He signed the order for the widow's pension. He passed the night at the distance of a short march from Potsdam. Next morning, we met some of the Saxon cavalry who were quitting the Prussian army to return to Saxony. We now learned that the Prussian army had recrossed the Elba and was making every exertion to regain the odor towards Stettin. The emperor ordered Marshal Sewell and Bernadotte, who were on the right bank of the Elba, to press the enemy as closely as possible. He was harassed with fatigue and experienced great privations. Marshal Ney remained on the left bank of the Elba for the twofold purpose of observing Magdeburg and guarding the passage of the river against the Prussian army. If being too closely pressed by the court of Sewell and Bernadotte, it should attempt to recross to the left bank and throw itself into another part of Germany by which means the French army would be drawn to a distance from Prussia. The Corps of Marshal Land was directed on Spandau which surrendered at the first summons so that this corps being afterwards disposable was carried behind the Havel on the other side of the spree. The emperor arrived at Potsdam was lodged in the castle. It was broad day when he entered the town, and he immediately went to visit the two palaces of Sanssouci. He admired the beauty of the large palace and made some remarks on the site chosen for that beautiful residence. The soil is so unfavorable to vegetation that the trees never attain any considerable growth. The little palace of Sanssouci greatly interested him. He examined the apartment of Frederick the Great, which is religiously respected none of the furniture has been displaced and certain splendor constitutes no part of its value plainer or commoner furniture could not be found in any broker's shop in paris the writing table appeared to me to be similar to those which are still seen in the offices of our old French notaries, the inkstands and pens were still upon it. The emperor opened several of the books which he knew Frederick the Great was fond of reading and which contained marginal notes written in the king's own hand, upon which the emperor made some observations. Some of these notes seem to have been written under the influence of ill humor. The emperor ordered the door to be opened by which Frederick the Great used to go down to the terrace beside the garden and also the door through which he used to pass when he went to review his troops on the great sandy plain near the palace on the side opposite to the garden. The emperor returned to Potsdam to pass the night. He was much pleased with the elegance of the king of Prussia's apartments and he forbade that the queen's private apartments should be occupied by any person whatever. He gave the same order Berlin with reference to some apartments which were prepared for the queen in a small house, which is one of her favorite residences. On the 20th of October, the emperor's headquarters were at Charlottenburg. Curiosity having induced some persons to visit the queen's apartments at this place, they found in a drawer a memorial drawn up by de Maurier on the means of destroying the power of France. It was carried to the emperor who, on seeing it, 
could not repress his indignation. Next day, the 21st, one month after his departure for Paris, and having taken rather circuitous route, the emperor entered Berlin. He was on horseback, accompanied by the guard, two divisions of cuirassiers, the foot guards, and the whole of Marshal Davout's court, for whom he had reserved the honor of being the first to enter the Prussian capital. The weather was delightful. Almost all the population of the city seemed to be out of doors, and the windows were filled with ladies. To the honor of the ladies of Berlin, I must observe that though they evinced considerable curiosity on this occasion, yet the most profound grief was expressed in the countenance of all, and many were bathed in tears. They were generally very exceedingly beautiful. Their patriotic feeling powerfully excited our interests and respect. The emperor alighted at the king's palace, where he took up his abode. The troops were stationed on the Kustrin and Stettin roads, with the exception of the guard, which was quartered in Berlin. The emperor sent me with a detachment of a hundred dragoons on reconnaissance. He had not received so much intelligence of the enemy as he wished. And he had an admirable tact in anticipating any approaching event. A direct I directed my course on Nowen, and at first sitting out, I proceeded so expeditiously that before daylight, I had established myself in ambuscade between Nowen and Spandau, where I suspected some stray Prussian detachment would take refuge. The surrender of Spandau being not yet known, accordingly at daybreak, some baggage and a number of led horses approached. These were accompanied by fugitives from all the Prussian regiments. I allowed them to advance a good way into the defile where I was stationed and then went forward to address them. None attempted to escape except those in the rear who took to flight and were pursued in vain. This was a good capture and my men made a tolerable booty. I did not, however, obtain much information for among the whole party who had quitted the army long since there was not a single man who would give me any satisfactory intelligence i sent the column to spend out as i conjectured they knew nothing of the surrender of the fortress about two hours after a man on horseback followed by baggage of the prince of orange appeared in sight he was better informed than those who preceded him he had come from Retnau, where he left prince hohenloa all the Prussian troops were in the neighborhood and were about to march by out Rupin on Prince Lau. I immediately sent information of this to the emperor. The prince's baggage immediately arrived. The man who had the care of it gave me some satisfactory accounts. I captured none of the baggage except a box of claret which was a valuable thing in Prussia. On my march from now into Fairbellin, I met a Prussian flag of truce who was sent by Prince Hohenloa with orders to deliver his dispatch and then return. I was not to be duped. Prince Hohenloa's object was to ascertain precisely where we were that he might either quicken or retard his march accordingly. I blindfolded the flag of truce and sent him by express to the Emperor at Berlin. I did right. For we learned from the flag of truce that he had left Prince Ho and Loa at New Rupin, preparing to depart for Prince Lau. And on this information, the emperor directed the dragoons and the court of martial land to proceed up the Havel by forced marches on Prince Lau. They reached the bridge of Prince Lau a few hours before the head of the Prussian column appeared on the other bank of the river. Both sides were so much fatigued that a parley readily ensued the Prussian troops which was most in advance, was a regiment belonging to the King's Guard, which, supposing all was lost, were very glad to return to Berlin. An arrangement was proposed and immediately concluded. Prince Ho and Lois surrounded with all the troops who were there, which was a very considerable number, and he transferred to General Blucher the command of those troops who were too distant to be included in the capitulation, the regiment of the King's Guards, and all the colors and standards of the troops composing the corps of Prince Hohenlohe were sent to Berlin. This event was very satisfactory to the emperor who urged Marshal Soult and Bernadotte not to leave General Blucher a moment's respite. He again sent me from Berlin with two regiments of light cavalry to pursue all the troops whom Blucher might detach from his army with a view of misleading Bernadotte and Soult. 
Chapter 25. I assembled the two regiments before mentioned, namely the first two swords, and the seventh chasseurs at Fairbellin, and advanced immediately by forced marches through New Rupin, Rinsburg, and Strelitz. In the last town, I found Prince Charles of Mecklenburg, a younger brother of the Queen of Prussia's and a major in the guards. He had left the army to return to his family. I allowed him to proceed, contenting myself with making him sign an endorsement by which he bound himself not to bear arms against France until after a peace or his exchange. There would have been no great merit in making a prisoner in this situation, and besides, I could not have carried him with me. I was well received by the Prince of Mecklenburg, in whose residence I passed the night. Next morning, I proceeded in the direction of Surberg in order to reach Varen at an early hour. On the road, I heard a cannonade in advance of me. I made all haste and found Marshal Mar Bernadotte engaged with Blucher before Varen. Blucher had rallied the wrecks of the Prince of Hohenlohe's corps and added them to what he had previously collected of the army which fought against Marshal Davu. His corps farmed nearly the only remnant of the Prussian force 